some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and today I'm going to be doing another top 10 list. This is going to be the top 10 uh, more great games of 2023. Now normally, every other year, I just do a top 10 of 2020 whatever, of whatever the year is, and uh, that's it. But 2023 was actually particularly interesting because... It felt like it was kind of a lax year until it wasn't, until there was just a bunch of other games that just kind of came out that were all fantastic. And I just felt like, uh, hey, I'll do another top 10 of fantastic games that just didn't quite make it into the actual top 10. Uh, so we'll go ahead and, and talk about all of those. And yeah, um, if I sound like I'm sick that's because I am <laughs> so uh, bear with me I'm pretty much getting over it but I might sound a little bit stuffy uh, let's so let's go ahead and jump on in with what would be um, the honorable mention of this list so I'm gonna kind of still do a 10 um, instead of just being like this is the number 22 that's just I mean I don't know, but uh, so with the honorable mention on this more great games, that would be, whoops, <laughs> a game called Cartouche uh, that came out in 2010. Uh, so Cartouche is a game that I had backed because it was just kind of, um, I think it was cheaper just to back, and it was a polyomino game, and this one actually took me by surprise uh, quite a bit. Because, as with other polyomino games, which I just pretty much love most of them, uh, this one just worked out really well with its sense of puzzly nature. Like, it's set in Egypt, which, I mean, the theme doesn't really matter. But the, the game actually has, so it has uh, tile drafting, so you draft your tiles and then you place them and then obviously you score them. But you have various ways that you are going to score based off of the objectives that are out there and uh you can also go for different goals and there's different ways to actually play this game too uh i've actually only ever played it at two but how you're positioning the pieces on your board uh, to match certain hieroglyphs and trying to get certain runs and sections and closed off natures uh, really brings an air of freshness to it because a lot of polyomino games you're just trying to fill out a board which is perfectly fine, and there's various ways of doing that, but like in Feast for Odin, you're filling out the board to get rid of negative points. In uh, Isle of Cats, you're filling out your board to not get negative points. And then here, uh, you're actually going for different shapes because you're trying to close off these, these cats, or you're trying to get a river, or you're trying to complete objectives that you have picked out because it does a little bit of card drafting as well as tile drafting. I found this to be surprisingly fascinating um, and really puzzly. So it's it's a really good one if you're looking for a polyomino style game without it being uh, like, I mean, too expensive to go out and get. Because I know Feast for Odin can be pricey and Isle of Cats can be pricey if you're trying to get all the expansions. This one's a ver uh, one with a really small footprint. That is Cartouche. <laughs> So that's the honorable mention of the more great games. The number 10 of, of this one, which is actually a surprise that anyone even got it, and that is Subterra 2, Inferno's Edge. And let me check. I believe I have done a review for all of these. Yes, probably by the time this video comes out, I will have a review over all of them. But... Number 10 is Subterra 2 Inferno's Edge, which, if you're familiar with this whole ordeal at all, uh, basically the company went under and it was picked up by another company who handled the whole situation very well, I think. Um, I'm not quite sure if everyone got their copy, but a lot of people got their copies, which is really good. Uh, so this is a sequel to Subterra, although they play completely different. Like, if you're a fan of the first one, I wouldn't actually say that you'd be a fan of the second, because it depends on why you're a fan of the first. If you're a fan of the first one for its uh, 
like atmosphere, it's spelunking, creepy nature. This is not that. This is more your high action Indiana Jones kind of uh, feeling where you're going into an active volcano to try and get this artifact. And, I mean, it plays pretty much like the original. So you have characters with various abilities that you use action points to do, and you have um, hit points and stuff like that, and then you can go out and deal with uh, hazards, various hazards of the, the volcano closing in. But what makes this one really... I mean, if, so if you like the gameplay of Subterra 1, then you'll like Subterra 2. What made this one fascinating was the fact that it has lava tiles. And so if you're going in with that action, high energy kind of feeling, then you're going to have a great time because whenever you go in and you're trying to get these separate keys by flipping these tiles. So once you get the keys and you unlock where the artifact is and you grab it, that's when kind of the, um, you know, the final act plays out. And the volcano starts erupting, and all the tiles start bleeding out, and they start uh, flipping over. So whenever you flip over these tiles, like from here, they'll start to move out. And so it's like, okay, now it hits here, then it hits here, then it hits, I don't know, I'm pointing, but like then it hits here, and then it hits here as the all the connected tiles flip into lava tiles. And of course, if you're standing there, you uh, burn alive. It's... It's really good. Like, I I really enjoy this one. I have both in my collection. One, because it's like, well, I'm surprised I got this one at all. Um, but they both uh, scratch a different itch, but still feel familiar, which I like. So that is my number 10, Subterra 2. <laughs> my number 9, where is it, uh, is a deck-building traditionally 1v1 card game that that took me by surprise because I just didn't expect it to be as good but it has some depth in a tiny box and that is Solar Titans so Solar Titans is a deck building 1v1 ship uh, game I mean you can play with more players but I think in the base game it basically tells you to play 1v1 and what you're doing is you have these yeah oh you have these ship parts and everyone starts out with the same ship but how it's built is different based off the layout you choose at the beginning of the game and what you're trying to do is you're trying to destroy the opponent's command deck and once that's done you win and in a free-for-all it's last man standing but over time your parts are going to start getting destroyed and you only have so many repairs left, so you have to be conscious of what you're wanting to do with that. But it's like a traditional deck builder. You have currency in your hand that you buy cards from a market, and they could be more guns, they could be ship parts, they could be various abilities that go into your deck. And on your turn, you can actually modify your ship, so it has a little bit of tableau building Um with the various types of guns that you're going to be shooting off. And I just thought that this was, uh, I mean, it was pretty clean. Like the whole game was uh, like a breath of fresh air kind of whenever you're playing it. And there's not many, I mean, there are 1v1 games, but none of them are about tableau building that I'm aware of. Like the two 1v1 games that I play are Star Realms and Hero Realms. And those are just pure deck builders. This one, you have to take into effect uh, your 5x5 five five grid, placement of pieces, where you're going to place your armor plates, where you're going to place your guns, how they're going to be placed, because some of them gain benefits for being next to certain uh, other cards. And it's just, it's really neat. Like, for the price point as well, I think it was like $25 to back it. It, uh, I mean, it, it packs a pretty good punch. I would like to see just more content for it but i think that from the base game alone they they have some depth here i mean they have different ways for you to be like 1v3 or uh, a solo mode where you go up against this titan or you can be a titan versus against like two massive ships going against one another so there's some game in here uh and if you like deck building and you like tableau building i think this is one to give a give a shot and if you like competitive games then this one, like I said, is a very small footprint. Like, here's actually a picture of the box. That's it. Just three caddies for decks of cards just in here. 
and you have many many ways to play so i i obviously i enjoy it because i'm talking about it so that is my number nine solar titans my number eight is a hidden movement game and hidden movement games lately have kind of been a big miss for me um, just because I have my staples that I like and the ones that have been coming out lately just haven't been for me uh, whether that's because of theme or just because of gameplay or just I mean whatever it might be this one both has theme and unique <coughs> excuse me and unique gameplay that I uh, really enjoy so and that is stifling dark so stifling dark was a game that i actually saw on gen con they were not demoing it but previewing it just kind of showing what they had uh they weren't playing the game or anything uh there's like no pay oh wait there's 17 images i guess they're all like this here we go weird oh this actually must be what was shown at, at gen con so uh, this is a, like I said, one versus many game. It's a hidden movement game where one person is playing an adversary and the other play players are playing investigators trying to gather evidence. The gimmick of this game is that you use these flashlight tokens to see um, anything on the board. So, well, that's kind of blurry. But basically all of these spaces are dim and then the spaces that are dotted are dark. So... When players are moving, there are uh, objectives and things around the board that they can't see. So they have to use their flashlight to actually see all the spots that connect back to them. I think this is a fascinating and extremely thematic element of the game. Uh, I will say this game does require probably a full player count, at least one less like so you can play five players with four investigators and one adversary you could do three investigators and one adversary and be fine just because the how the players find the adversary they need the flashlight and um you can tag team a lot of uh combos with more investigators going around and also it allows you to go out and find more stuff but this one this is just such a neat idea it's extremely atmospheric where when they're running around and they don't want to use their flashlights then that that's an opportunity for the adversary to come up and do what they're wanting to do there are two different types of boards with different ways that those are played so i just really like the way that this plays out like it it has like both its sides where the investigators feel really powerful and then all of a sudden when they don't and that's like because uh, like the butcher for example he just has to kill one investigator to win and it's actually kind of hard if they're all teaming up to prevent you from wounding but it's like i've had one game where a friend of mine here i can actually zoom in even though it's blurry as hell he like ran through this window here and even though so you can go through windows but if you keep moving you take a wound and wounds are really hard to get rid of so like as soon as like he cut himself through the glass thematically he's the one i targeted it's like well time to die and that just feels very thematic it's um it's a unique one so i i very much enjoy it i have my qualms with it uh hence why these games aren't in the top 10 of the year but like it's it's a really good one and i'm hoping they make more so that is my number <laughs> i already forgot because i can't see it immediately uh, 11 10 9 that's my number eight the stifling dark my number seven is technically a remake um it's it's based off of another game that the same company made but it added a little bit more to it and this is the one that i've actually kept in my collection and that is search for lost species so the one that this one yeah re-implements is the search for planet x but i felt that this game one i like the theme more i like the searching for animals than just a planet um but it adds a little bit more to it than just pure logic i mean this one still is pure logic like all the animals and the species have rules about them like the aru flying fox is not adjacent to the python that's just a rule that it has uh and then all the other um animals have 
have rules about them as well that just is variable through the app. But what makes this one a lot more fun, in my opinion, is the fact that you actually have a board that you're moving around. So you're, you have different types of terrain that you have to take into consideration. You have to utilize your piece here and move it around doing actions. That's your time element of this game. Um, there are these towns that you can go into that will allow you to get these uh, item cards or whatever they're called, I can't remember, but that give you a special ability that, oh, hey, doing this action actually only costs you two time instead of four or whatever it might be. Um, you have tokens that you can place out on the board that will, like a camera, that will give you an exact information of that spot, but it takes forever for it to come back, so you have to be wise about when you want to use it. It utilizes the same uh, like point system whenever you're saying, okay, like I believe the python is here, and I was the first one to put that down, um, and gathering information on your sheet, like... Uh, in search for planet X has, I mean, if you've seen search for planet X, then you've seen this exact sheet here, obviously with a different type of layout. But the fact that there's a board, I like the board element, I like the card element, and I like that the species has different rules about them. So there's a little bit more to this that makes me like it quite a bit uh, that I just ended up keeping this one. I mean, the initial issue is obviously with pure logic is that if you write something down or you mistap on the app and you just get wrong information, then you're kind of just hosed. But uh, just I guess just pay more attention. I'm talking to myself here because I misclicked on a uh, in a game and it was I was like, wait a minute, how is that wrong? Um, and it cost me the game, but that's okay. So. Yeah, this one, this one's really good. I don't have many Pure Logic games in my collection, uh, but this is one that I enjoy a lot, and the theming is very nice too. So, that is my number eight, seven. <laughs> Damn it, 11, 10, 9, 8. That was my number seven, the search for lost species. <laughs> my number six is a game that came out at the beginning of the year, um, the, I mean, this is probably going to say something different, but I have it uploaded at the beginning of the year, and I'm pretty sure I played it as soon as it came out. Uh, at least I got my copy at the beginning of the year, and that is Artisans of Splendent Vale. Yeah, it says 2022, but I'm saying it's 2023 um, either way. Uh, this is why it's not in the top 10, because it says 2022. That's actually not true, but uh, I actually have put in an edit for this to be 2023, so I'm hoping I'm right. Anyway, either way, because I don't think this was in my 2022 list. I hope it's not. Uh, anyway, Artisans of Splendid Vale. This one is a campaign-driven storytelling game where each player is actually playing one of these characters and they have their own book. So this is really for players who really enjoy reading um, because there's a lot of it. And I think this also works best if you're playing with players who kind of like to role play because what's really neat about this game is all the characters have i mean they're written and they have personalities and they have interactions with one another they have uh different feelings towards one another they have different jobs that they level up differently um but what's really cool is whenever you're reading stuff and you have your paragraph underneath it will have an icon of another player that is like just going to be dots on your page but that's meant for other players to chime in so for example if uh, i think it's hobby if Javi is uh, talking and then underneath him is Farah's icon, then Javi will say his stuff. And then that's when the player playing Farah should jump in and kind of keep the story going. Um, yeah, you have your own character sheet, different potions you're carrying, different traumas you can get from taking damage, different uh, items that can be upgraded. There's another character who can upgrade items and there's kind of a 
legacy aspect to this game just with various cards that can be have stickers put on them you can like far as the tailor so he can create clothes for everyone hobbies the artificer so he can create uh, uh artifacts for other players and then on top of the storytelling element yeah there's the four characters yeah romani javi soraya and farah so and they all have just different ways that they level up and that they play on top of that you have your storytelling element of a choose your own adventure kind of which path you want to go down and then you have your meeples for your combat and the um and like that's the actual like gameplay part of it the other thing is kind of like a yeah that's all in the book with like reading out stories and seeing various um locations that some people can see and some people can't because their characters are like in tune with nature so the nature person can have an interaction with a tree and things like that so it's it's unique in the sense that i haven't seen something done like this uh i very much love the the art and the storytelling and the gameplay is done really well too uh i mean they have your traditional like uh, uh status tokens down here that you'll apply to enemies and they'll apply to you the initiative is done in such a way that it's based off of the encounter and honestly for store for games like this i love the spiral bound book this is like the way plaid hat does it now is just the best way i think so yeah there's a lot of depth to this um but it does the reason why it's not higher is just because this game is very difficult to find a group for like you it's like you almost need like there's there's you almost need just like four people because you don't want two people reading from from or one person reading from two books i i think if you can get a full four player group of people who want to role play and want to be in, invested in the story and the gameplay i mean that's that's a tall order but if you can get that you'll you're gonna have a great time so that is my number six. My number five is actually a brand new game that just came my way. It's a solo only game, which surprisingly there's um, quite a few that hit this list. And that is Witchcraft. So I have not played Resist, so I don't have any connection to that. Uh, but Witchcraft is one that I backed, I mean, mainly for the theme and I heard Resist was really good. Um, and Witchcraft is an amazing puzzle experience of, of the Salem Witch Trials. I mean, Salem Witch Trials, it's, it's loosely tied to that. Um, but what you're doing here is you are, at the beginning of the game, you're building your deck of your coven. And, yep, cool. So, you have your witches here that have a hidden ability, or in this case, they don't. Uh, and a revealed ability and in whenever you're going to uh, try and deal with a location you get to play your witches first and then you get to reveal all these cards that are kind of protecting this location that are from like the demons or whoever it is and then you get to play more witches uh, after you've seen some some of the negative effects that are becoming your way uh, and I really like that dynamic. That's one of my favorite things is that you get to try and set up and boost yourself before you go and deal with the problem. And then you get to see what's there. And then you get to be like, oh, okay, now I can try and mitigate all the, I, all the stuff that's here to try and still succeed at this problem. Like the protecting our livestock requires four power. It's like, okay, well, I could reveal all my witches and get all their abilities but if you reveal witches they go to jail which means they get removed from your deck so you also have to make the difficult decision of whether or not you want to reveal them or keep them hidden if you have ways to actually get them out of jail all the while you are trying to figure out what these three jurors uh what their persuasion levels are because you're trying to increase their persuasion with you because at the end of the game you can go to uh you can go to court or go to trial and reveal all the ones you haven't and if your number is equal to or higher than that uh that number then you've persuaded them and you want to get all three 
uh, before you actually fail. And there's tons of ways for you to fail. Just the the simple gameplay with the strategic depth of this game is done so well. And I love the variety. The three jurors have their projects, um, or not projects, problems uh, kind of tied to who they are, as well as the deck of variety, the deck of enemy cards that are going to be placed out are tied to them as well. And just the different creative ways you can actually build your coven deck but the deck deconstruction is something that you don't see a whole lot of. I mean, obviously it's in deck builders, like removing cards from your, your deck, but that's after you've added a whole bunch. You don't really just have a set number, and then it's like, okay, well, I'm going to be getting rid of these. Uh, and the theme is done extremely well, too, and I like the fact that they also made a scenario book that you can go through that just differentiates how the game is going to be played. So Witchcraft, very awesome solo game and that is my number five <laughs> my number four is funny enough another solo game that uh was i believe originally in my top 10 but i had played a bunch of other games at the time and had to reorganize my top 10 so a bunch of games kind of fell out and this was one of them but this one took me by surprise also, and that is 20 Strong. So 20 Strong is a solo-only game by Chip Theory Games, where the initial game is the Solar Sentinels, but it comes with the Too Many Bones, uh, Hoplomachus, and I think that's it. Yeah, Too Many Bones, Hoplomachus, and Solar Sentinels. Um, yeah, okay, I was thinking there was, there was a another one but there's not essentially this game is about dice rolling and your best ways to mitigate that and going through a deck of cards like it's purely a deck and dice game and whenever i first saw i mean i i back pretty much anything chip theory does i'm like oh okay this was like 70 bucks for everything with free shipping like all right uh i mean if it sucks then I'll just sell it, but it, whenever I saw the, the gameplay for it, I was like, oh shit, this is going to be just another, I mean, a random game that, like, you have no agency over, but it can be that. Uh, you can just still get host on dice, and that's, that's what it is, but for the most part, I think you get quite a bit of choice and mitigation with these dice. For me, it's actually a pretty fair balance because what you're doing in the Solar Sentinels, which is the base game, you have three decks of enemies and you're basically deciding which one you want to go after. So you have three options and they they will have obviously their damage that they're doing, they have the their health, and whenever you choose to attack them, you have, if you have your entire pool of dice, you get to decide what dice to actually roll. And obviously the dice go up in superiority, so yellows have only two hits, uh, greens have three, blues have four, purples have five, and red is kind of like Coplamachus, it's always a hit. So depending on how you build, like this character, or this player has five health, three re-rolls, uh, essentially, and two dice recovery, so you're building in a certain way with potentially having a bunch of items that you can actually be like, okay, I'm going to use these yellows because yellow with this item actually will always be hits. Uh, I'm going to always use my red because I get a recovery of two. So at the end of the round, I can recover my red. Um, but you're taking a look at all the enemies. It's like, okay, this needs eight health. This is three. This is six. So you can chuck a whole bunch of dice knowing full well you're only getting a few back but you might have an item that gives them all back to you anyway so yeah killing enemies and getting a build going kind of gives me the feeling of a very quick roguelite uh not uh that at least in solar sentinels works extremely well just by seeing what the i mean it's really a puzzle like too many bones has that exact same feeling of like yeah, this isn't thematic in any way, but you get to look at the board state and figure out how you're going to overcome the challenge in the best way possible. 
And for a game that's as quick to set up as, I mean, this is, funny enough, one of my most played games of the year just because of how quick it is to set up, how many times I just ran through Solar Sentinels with different um, characters and then too many bones, where it plays basically with this gameplay, but at but feeling like too many bones. And then Hoplomachus, it's not six hours to go through... Um, let's see, does it have expansions? Yeah. It's not six hours to go through a campaign of Hoplomachus. You get to basically feel like you're playing Hoplomachus with... I mean, because you roll a bunch of dice in Hoplomachus anyway. You get to do that here, dealing with the... Oh, I don't remember what they were called. But the the different factions and the different types of enemies, like if you end up fighting the, was that, Earthian, Barthian? Uh, he has an extra enemy, but uh, red, purple, and green dice cannot be applied to him. Uh, and they have Banes and stuff. This one, the Hoplomachus one, was actually surprisingly one of my favorites, even though I don't like the game it's based off. This one just had a really cool setup. And then the Too Many Bones ones, is if you're not feeling like a full thing of too many bones, you could set up 20 strong, too many bones, and uh, and get a, a similar feeling to that. Now, obviously, if you really like the base games of too many bones and Hoplomachus, this isn't gonna replace that. But if you're like, well, I don't have the time, I'm on a trip, you can easily take this one and and get that same type of itch while using a different system. Yeah, because this has the baddies of five point and one point baddies and then different uh, nemesis you're going after. And these are the six or the five uh, gear locks that they have. So yeah, 20 strong. Just really like how the dice system work and how quick it is uh, and just the agency you actually have to play the game. So that is my number four. My number three is a new game that I just played that really took me by surprise, and I wonder if it even has the year on it now. Yes, it does. It did not. I think this actually got added because I edited it. I, I was like, hey, this came out in 2023. And that is Ar uh, Arakan Wars. Um, Arakan Wars is kind of a unique uh, game where you... It's a tactical grid-based game. And you might be thinking, oh, like Summoner Wars? Well, not really, because the way you play is you actually have your you have your own faction that so you do deck construction. It's a deck construction game, and you will utilize these cards to place them on a grid to use their various abilities. But how you win is actually by having the most points. So each of these cards, like the Tree of Life, is ten points. Swamp Ogre is three points. Um, and whenever you're placing these cards, you're activating their abilities. And so some cards can just stay there. Uh, but various cards will have a flight or movement ability that when you activate them, you actually get to move them. And it's very, it feels very like go-like in that positioning is kind of everything. Um, and orienting your cards in a way that they can group attack to take down a higher level card or a higher defense card like this tree of life is a land that if the that has a defense of four but if the forge patriarch and the swamp ogre were to combine attacks well i mean you have to have a higher attack but let's say it was going to be five then they take over that and that's a 10 point swing in their favor um my favorite thing about uh iraq and wars is actually the fact that they understood the assignment of a deck construction game. Like, I don't think this company is... <sighs> it's definitely their first game. It's, his, it's the first... It's the designer's first design. Yeah. But the introduction guide into how they teach you to play this game is stellar. It is so good. Like, just a step-by-step... -step, I mean, just a sheet of saying, here's how you play your first game. And then here's... How, here's all the keywords that what they mean, just in a very organized rule book that if you ever have a question on what a card does, you can immediately find it. How it, it uh, 
instructs how to deck construct like it, it gives you the pre-cons and then it's like hey take these four cards out add these four in and here's what this new deck does it's brilliant you never see that in a deck construction game like there was another one that came out that what that was also deck construction and it could not have been the anti like the complete opposite of what this one does like that one was just like oh yeah just start constructing it's like you no one knows how your game is played um yeah just i mean the the example of how to deck construct and then having a bunch of ways like a bunch of rules on how to deck construct and just various ways to play this game it's awesome and it's different too like if this was kind of your standard you know 1v1 deck construction game to fight enemies against and cast spells I mean, it'd still be good, I think it'd still be, but I wouldn't be raving about it as much as I am now just because it's different on the grid, like the grid-based placement where it's not about killing the other summoner or killing the hero. It's about, hey, okay, game's over. Now let's count up our points and see who has the most and whoever has the most wins. It's, pre it's pretty fascinating. So I'm hoping they continue. I mean, on the box, it says, you know, first edition season one. So I'm hoping that this did well enough to warrant a season two and just more cards. But I, if you're looking for a unique style, um, like card game, like a con deck construction card game, I would give this one a shot because it's, it's definitely up there. Especially if you're looking to get into deck construction, not necessarily for like magic or anything like that, but just, oh, I've never played one before. This one will teach you how to do it. It's really cool. So that is my number whatever. My number... Uh, that's one. That was my number three. My number three, Arakan Wars. Not a fan of the name, though. I don't know why they went with that name. My number two was originally in the top ten... Uh, but like I said, just kind of got like my number two and my number one for this just kind of got bumped out, unfortunately, because other two other games kind of hopped in at the last minute, and that is Barcelona. So Barcelona, Board and Dice has just been knocking it out of the park lately, like l like with with uh, Tilatum and Barcelona and another game. Um, this one was just very, very surprising. Uh, and what's funny is, like, I actually saw this at Gen Con. This is the one I picked up, but I saw their other game, Nucleum, and I was like, eh, I'll get this one. And really, I should have just gotten both. But, because, I mean, this art is amazing. Um, but yeah, so with Barcelona, this is like as point salady of a game as as you can get everything gives you points everything gives you huge swaths of points too where like your final score is like in the 300s which i mean there's no difference like if, if a if a you know play is giving you 30 points i mean you could also just minimize that and just make it be three points but i don't know every now and then it's nice to have a really high score instead of being like yeah this game uh like a really good score is like seven like that's like so it's really really hard to get points. So if you can get to seven, you're you're pretty much god gamer. It's like here it's like yeah, a pretty average score is like four seventy two. It's like yeah, that's if you're not really trying. Um, but the the gameplay of this one it's thematically tied to a lot all, a lot of the actions which are explained in the rule book on why decision making was done when designing designing the game but essentially you you are getting various citizens of upper middle and lower class to move into these types of buildings so you have these workers uh next to your board of the three types and you're placing them into these corridors not corridors in these uh rows and columns to be able to eventually have those workers uh, build these types of buildings. And so you'll get, you have this uh, track that you'll go up if you're going, I cannot remember the name of the guy who was, it'll say it, it'll say it somewhere. Um, yeah, Ildefon Seoda. Yep. 
um, the considered the inventor of urbanism. So you'll go up on the Cerda track if you're building like sm like smaller buildings that are more lush and open to more greenery versus you'll go up on the Sagrada track and lower on the Cerda track if you're closing all those and making it very industrial with lots of buildings so you're not having as much, you know, parks and stuff. Um, tons of ways to get points. The way that the game event naturally progresses is really, really cool too because whenever you build, use those people, they come down here on this track and then you score points based off the number, the lowest number shown. Uh, also, while trying to keep in mind these game uh, objectives, like, because you can also get technologies that you're, or not really technologies, but these various ways to score at the end of the game. This one's, hey, for every citizen you've placed on the board through your tram, you'll get two points. For every large road you've played, you get two points. Your longest contiguous uh, road will get you uh, two points per. Just ways like that by placing these, I don't remember what these were called either, but they these things can be placed in the middle of these sections here so that if other people use it to, you'll get rewards for it, placing roads down to get you your tram to move more efficiently. Um, I also just like the way actions are chosen. Like these are printed on the board, but there's, tiles that so you can randomize it um so if you place your workers here you're going to do this action and this action it just feels good this game feels very good whenever you're playing uh just every action just feels like it's the right action and whenever you do like whenever you're playing and you're like okay i'm gonna do this action and finish this and that's gonna get me 60 points because we're scoring right now and it's like oh geez it's done so well um and I just like that these games, like Board and Dice just does a really good job with variety, the different types of um, unique buildings that you can get. These like There's going to be different ones of these, different tiles that are coming out. Um, like I said, you could randomize the actions here, so that's going to give you different uh, combinations, different, uh, well, the Sagrada, those things are the same. But yeah, this one is a really good one and like i said it was almost in my top 10 but just just squeaked out and well that's kind of one of the reasons why i'm talking about um these 10 games because they were just all really good and finally my number one for this top 10 uh top 10 more top 10 more games of 2023 uh this would uh, not this would this is not the honorable mention because I do honorable mentions for the actual top ten, but this one was so close and it was in so many people's top ten. Uh, I think I just played various other games that no one has. I mean, no one values as much as I do, but this game is still fantastic and could easily have jumped in. Like anyway, the my number one is Earth. So Earth is just so good. Like the the just the way that this game plays is again kind of like Barcelona, where you're just you feel like you're just always doing well. Um, whenever you're playing and you're getting to choose your actions, you just choose. Oh, I'm gonna do a blue or a green, red, blue or yellow action, and then you get to do a top, and then everyone else gets to do a bottom all your green stuff off your cards that has green abilities trigger then everyone else's green abilities trigger um i love i mean the artwork i love photographic art like this i don't like photo stock cards like battlestar galactica or harry potter hogwarts battle i don't like that kind of stuff but here just showing various locations of the world the different animals different fauna it's gorgeous um, and it covers pretty much everything. Like you have your, uh, animal cards that are going to be like various, uh, public objectives that everyone's going for. Let's see, this might be a, yeah. So this one, it's like, Hey, these are what everyone's going for. You have these, um, oh, I don't remember what these were called, but these were again, various ways to score points. I think these are in, yeah, this is in German. But the, the elephant's going to score differently, the owl's going to score differently, the worms are going to score differently, so you're, you're racing to try and f 
finish those objectives to get the most points. Um, on top of you having your own tundra, your own island, uh, your own, I mean, that's for, um, oh, there, there are four events, but I, I think, is that, maybe that's what they were called. And then your own uh, ecosystem. I know a little bit of German, so I'm trying to read through context clues. But on top of just various unique startup uh, cards that you've chosen, you just build out your tableau, getting uh, getting different types of seeds and tree toppers and um, it's not soil. It is something else. These green cubes that represent something uh, for everything to just trigger when you do an action and it's it i mean someone was asking like oh it was on everyone's top 10 is earth really that great i i think so i think earth is one of those that you can teach it looks like a lot and to some people it might be but i've taught this game to a lot of people and it just kind of clicks because the fact that everyone's getting to do something all the time feels good uh because there are a lot of games where it's like, hey, my stuff doesn't interact with your stuff at all. But I, so here's my action, and I'm going to do all my stuff. Okay, now your turn, and I don't really care about your turn. Here, it doesn't matter what players are picking, because you're actually hoping that they pick a certain color, because you want your stuff to trigger. Um, and the game's not too long, either. It's just, and I mean, and any game that brings in... Um, like facts about the card I just love. Like Wingspan does that. And I mean, the games that don't, that are centered around real life, if they don't have like facts about the thing, it's kind of disappointing. And this does on every card. And I believe I saw something about an expansion coming out in 2024. So don't know how true that is. I have not officially like read anything, but it was in a geek list that I follow that it was like it just pulled up earth and just said hey they announced an expansion for 2024 so that's gonna be awesome so yeah earth my number one of the top 10 more games of 2023 and that's it everyone that is my 10 of, of basically 12 through 22 um I hope you enjoyed. If you like to hear me talk about more games, I could definitely do this again next year uh, for 2024. But if you haven't watched my top 10 games of the year, go check that out. And then the other uh, top list that we do for the year, which is top 10 expansions or top five expansions, top five uh, disappointing games and top five worst games. Those are all fun to do too. Um, other than that, let me know what your favorite games were. Let me know what you thought of these games in the comments below. Um, so yeah, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching, and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon, and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.